Welcome to a very special video where today we are celebrating 50 years of BMW M. And in this celebration, we're going to bring you almost every M car ever made. Some in the flesh or in the metal and some through other pictures and videos. But we thought what better location to do this shoot than with our friends at Partridge BMW in Hampshire. Partridge have very kindly arranged a collection of amazing cars for us to walk around, to sit in, to enjoy, and even a few to drive. And I can't wait to show you what we've got inside. So come on in. So let's start our journey by talking about this, the three litre BMW CSL. This is a car that came out of the late 1960s and was produced into the early 1970s. And whilst it's not a BMW M car as such, it's all this car's fault that the BMW M division started. There was a racing car version of this that was affectionately nicknamed the Batmobile. And what it had was a straight six, three liter engine that was so good and so reliable, it ended up making its way into quite successful racing cars. And from here, that's where the journey began. A derivative of the three litre straight six that came out of this iconic car made its way into a different car. This one over here. This is the first car to run with a BMW M badge on the back. It's known as the M1 and the only reason it exists as a road car is all thanks to the homologation process of motorsport back in the 1970s. This thing was so far ahead of its time when you think of supercars of the era mid-engined, rear-wheel drive, iconic design, a car that, believe it or not, was actually signed off by the Lamborghini design team. So if you can see through the shapes and the dimensions of the car, you can kind of see that Lamborghini influence of the late 1970s. The M1 really packed a punch. 277 brake horsepower back in the late 1970s was quite powerful. The other thing that was quite punchy was the price at £37,000. That's £2,000 more than the top of the range Ferrari of that era. What followed the M1 was the M535 and the M635. We don't have those here, but what we do have is the ultimate upgrade from those, the very first M5. This is the E28 M5, a car that once again used that same derivative engine from both the CSL and the M1. BMW effectively realised that this thing was a really reliable engine. Whilst built for motorsport purposes, it could be used day to day. So it found its way into here. Now BMW was so far ahead of everyone else at the era of producing the E28. A fast front engine, six cylinder family car just did not exist. In fact, BMW themselves at the time of launch weren't really sure how popular this thing would be. But as we all now know, this paved the way for pretty much every other sports car manufacturer in the world. What I especially love about the E28 M5 is that it was faster, considerably faster than the Ferrari 328 of the same era. So you could effectively go and buy a Ferrari supercar and enjoy that, or take the family for a spin and go even faster. 0 to 62 in 6.5 seconds at a top speed of 153 miles an hour. Even in today's standards, that's a fast car. Now, the next car on my list to show you is possibly the most significant car, certainly in my opinion, on this lineup in here. It's this, the BMW E30 M3. The E30 existed as a road car, but of course BMW in the era needed a fantastic race car, so they produced the E30 M3 racing car. A car that, believe it or not, shares only four panels with the road-going version. This is what BMW produced. They effectively shortened the six-cylinder engine to a four-cylinder because the six-cylinder was simply too heavy, dropped it in here, gave it individual throttle bodies, wider arches and the E30 was born. Now the interesting thing about the E30 is at the time of its launch, the customers weren't really that fussed. After all, why would you shorten the engine, remove two cylinders and call it the sports car? It just wasn't that popular. But then as time ticked on, it became very popular. BMW initially produced 5,000 units of these. They all sold out. They made another 5,000 and then again, another 10,000. So over 20,000 models of the E30 were produced and prices today are now skyrocketing. 60, 70,000 pounds might get you a half decent E30 M3. 
But what makes this so significant, in my opinion, is this set the benchmark back in the late 1980s. Even to this day, the M3 is regarded as the benchmark by all manufacturers. Everyone producing a fast coupe wants to be as good as the BMW M3. And it's all this car's fault. Anyone craving the howl of a six cylinder didn't have to wait long as the M engineers decided it was time to give the new 1988 E34 5 Series the M treatment. The E34 M5 was born and the consumers went wild for it. The straight six lived on in the form of the hand-built S38 engine. Interestingly, the E34 M5 was also available as a touring model, meaning a family estate car was now capable of 160 miles an hour, and you could order it in purple too. What followed the E30, well, that was quite a controversial move because that's this, the E36. The E30 is often regarded as a racing car that was put onto the road with a road-going version. The E36 that came next was completely the other way around. The marketing department was so surprised at how successful and how popular the E30 was that they decided they needed to put some influence on the next model. The consumer was happy because immediately the straight six engine was back. However, the motorsport fans weren't so sure because suddenly this thing was quite, well, soft and comfy and luxurious and not really in fitting with what a BMW motorsport fanatic might look for. But regardless of your opinion of the E36, it was a better car. It was slightly faster, it handled well, and it was more comfortable. So for the everyday user, it turned out to be quite a popular thing. The E36 was launched with that straight six, three litre engine, but not long after came the Evo version, which came as a 3.2. It gained an extra 200 cc's, and that meant it was the first production engine to produce 100 brake horsepower per litre in the engine, so a really significant thing. And depending on who you speak to, some say that the engine that's in the Evo is half of a McLaren F1 engine. The internet, I believe, is still out on debate on that one. Now, there is one other car just here that we will come back to, a very significant M car, but it's not quite in our sequence of events. So we'll come back to it. Soon after the E36 came a few other exciting M cars. In 1996, BMW M unveiled one of their Skunk Works projects, later to be known as the Z3M. The Z3M was available as both a roadster or a controversially shaped coupe. The Z3M used the same S50 inline six engine that had already been seen and celebrated in the E36. In 1998, it was time for the M5 to get a refresh, and the new model, the E39, also got a new heart. The E39 M5 was the first M car to be equipped with a V8 engine. The 4.9 litre S62 V8 rewarded drivers with 400 brake horsepower and a potential top speed of 186 miles an hour. The E39 was a huge hit thanks to the engine, the handling, and the new curvy styling, something that also found a home on the new M3. So we're now in the late 90s, early noughties. Think E39 M5, the first V8 powered M car, but also an engine that made its way into this. Possibly one of the most controversial cars that BMW produced. Many will recognize it as an iconic Bond car, but at the time, it wasn't particularly well received. And to this day, people aren't really too sure on whether they like it or not. It certainly divided opinions of our production team here. Q's not gonna like this. But what's happened now is this has become somewhat of an icon and a car that is now selling for hundreds of thousands of pounds. The new millennium arrived and in the year 2000, so did the E46 M3. Wider arches and a big power bulge on the bonnet made the latest M3 look fantastic. The E46 M3 stuck with the inline naturally aspirated ethos and the new engine, the S54, produced an incredible 338 brake horsepower. With the arrival of the noughties, more power 
definitely seemed to be the theme, as in 2005, the controversially styled E60 M5 and E63 M6 arrived with a nuclear bomb under the bonnet. The E60 M5 and the E63 M6 came along with a five litre naturally aspirated V10 engine, an engine that was very much designed to be a motorsport racing engine, but the engineering team were given the brief that it must also be reliable as well. And that's what ended up under the bonnet of this. Now the E60 M5 is possibly, again, one of the most controversial designs at the time of it coming out. And a bit like the M6 when it came out, designed by Bangle and his design team, people weren't too sure at first, but it has aged absolutely brilliantly. But design aside, it's what's under the bonnet that makes this thing so special. 501 horsepower from a naturally aspirated V10 and the noise like nothing else on the road at the time. Following the big E63 and E60, it was time for a new two-seater M-car, and in 2006, it arrived in the shape of the E86 Z4M. Like its predecessor, the Z3M, the Z4 was available as a roadster or a coupe and shared the power plant with the M3, the glorious six-cylinder S54. In 2007, with the arrival of the new M3, so came a new engine. The E92 M3 arrived with an attention-grabbing 4-litre naturally aspirated V8 an engine that screamed its way from 0 to 60 miles an hour in 4.6 seconds thanks to its 414 brake horsepower payload. In 2009, the M division decided to also share the love with BMW's latest SUVs, creating the E70 X5M and the E71 X6M. Whilst they weren't exactly M cars as far as the purists were concerned, with a 0 to 60 time of 4.7 seconds, they were certainly no slouch. A couple of years later, in 2011, M developed another car with a controversial M badge. This is the BMW 1M. This is a car that came along in 2011 and conveniently placed in, I'd say, the right location here, because once again, we were back to a six cylinder, three litre engine that powered it, but this time it had a twin scroll turbo. The reason that this car is quite controversial is because at the time of the M3 and the M5 coming along, this thing arrived and it was cheaper than both. In fact, it harked back to more of a motorsport heritage and design layout with engine cylinders and power to the E30 and the E36, more so than it did with the E90 at the time. So the public weren't too sure, and neither were the press, right up until the point that they drove it. And this has now become one of the most sought after modern day M cars, certainly in recent history, because prices of these are now stratospherically high. Low production numbers, iconic design, and of course, straight six, twin scroll turbo, and a rear wheel drive car, this paved the way for what came in our next era of BMW M3s. And they're right at the back. Also in 2011, BMW's M department shocked us again, this time with the new M5. But gone was the five litre Nuke V10, and in its place was a 4.4 litre V8 with turbos. The F10 M5 might have had a smaller engine, but it still packed a punch with 550 horsepower and a 0 to 60 sprint in 4.4 seconds. As the pattern would predict, the F13 M6 that arrived a year later in 2012 shared the engine and performance from the M5. But something strange started happening with the addition of rear doors. In 2014, it was time for a new M3, but also a new member of the family the M4. The F80 M3 arrived with a new inline six turbocharged engine and exclusively, for the first time ever, four doors. The two door variation of the M3 was now called the M4 and both the F80 M3 and the F82 M4 produced an impressive 425 brake horsepower and a 0 to 60 time of 4.3 seconds. 2016 saw the arrival of another Pocket Rocket M car, and this time 
it was called the M2. The F87 M2 had a tweaked version of the M235 engine, but shared components with the new M3 and M4. The result? 365 brake horsepower and a 0 to 60 time of 4.3 seconds. Gosh, it must nearly be time for a new M5. Oh look, it's 2017 and the F90 M5 has been made. Now, with 592 brake horsepower and four-wheel drive, the M5 is not so much of a fast family car, but a supercar slayer. The 4.4-litre turbocharged engine in the F90 grants 0-60 in 3.3 seconds, whilst providing all the luxuries of BMW's much-loved family saloon. A couple of years later in 2019, BMW M decided it was time to give the SUVs another go and rewarded the G01 X3M and the G02 X4M with the M3 and M4 powertrain. The same would later happen with the X5M. The M8 competition is the last missing car on our list, but it's worth a mention as yet another 4.4 litre V8 turbocharged engine found its way under the bonnet, but this time it produced an incredible 617 brake horsepower. For now, it's back to the showroom. So welcome to the modern era. We're back with, as I say, from the 1M, a three litre straight six twin scroll turbo powertrain. But now these things are producing mega, mega power. Of course, the big change that came with this iteration of M is the M4 exclusively had two doors, the M3 had four. A bit confusing for a lot of people, me included, but this has proven to be, whilst a controversial design, one of the most popular recent M cars to date. So there we have it. That completes our lineup, but not our video, as, like I mentioned earlier on, we do have the opportunity to take two cars out for a drive. The two that I've chosen, though, might not necessarily be the two that you'd expect. So here we are in the 1M or some would say the 1M Coupe, to give it its full name. Now, you might be thinking, that's an interesting choice. Out of all the cars you could have picked in that lineup, why this one? Well, this, a bit like the E36 M3, which I've also chosen to take out of the showroom, comes with quite an interesting story. Now, this came along at quite an interesting time for BMW because the average M customer could walk into their BMW dealership and buy either a V8 M3 with a stonkingly brilliant engine or a V10 M5 with an even more stonkingly brilliant engine. And then this came along. But rather than a big punchy V8 or a big streaming V10, this thing was equipped with a straight six. A turbocharged straight six, a twin scroll turbocharged straight six. So quite a punchy little thing. Now the M purists, obviously, their ears all pricked up with excitement when they heard of this new M car. And then of course, everyone started doing a bit of reading and discovered that strictly speaking, this thing didn't have an M engine. This isn't a motorsport derived engine block with turbos attached. This actually is the three liter that was found in the BMW Z4 of the time. The other big controversy was the way that this thing looked. At the time of its launch, it was quite radically different to everything else in the BMW range, and the average consumer wasn't too sure. But hey, what's changed there? What I love about driving this is the fact that it harks back to that straight six iconic layout. Straight six engine up front, rear wheel drive, it is, the perfect ingredients of what a BMW M car should be. Yes, it's turbocharged, and yes, that does add some controversy for some people, but to me, it doesn't matter. This thing absolutely sings. It sounds and feels like BMW M3s have done since the mid-1990s, but in a modern package. 
we're not in a overly glamorous modernized gadget filled environment here in fact if you've driven a one series of the same sort of era as this then chances are you've experienced everything that you can see in the car here and that doesn't matter because again think back to bmw m3s of that era they weren't filled with gadgets and technology because that's not what it was all about it was about the way that the car drove the way that the car handled the way that it made you feel as a driver and this thing encapsulates that perfectly i love the way that this thing feels this reminds me a lot of the e46 m3 which again came with a straight six but it just feels that little bit more refined and modern we've got a satellite navigation screen here admittedly this is very early stage bmw iDrive, but it does the job if you want to drive along and listen to music with good sound quality if you want to rely on a bit of sat nav technology from uh, 10 years ago then you can do that as well it's a car that you can use every day that's comfortable and that still feels really really special Having driven this around even just for a few miles, I can understand why this thing is so sought after. This, in comparison to the new M cars, is so raw, it's so visceral, feels so real. It's just such a lovely place to be. I like the fact that it's not fussy in here. I like the fact that everything is just so simple and basic. I like the fact that it's a small car as well. Again, my other gripe with modern cars is they're just so big. And this was just on that turning point, just before things got a little bit too big and a little bit silly. The 1M gets a massive, massive tick from me and definitely is worthy of being in our lineup of a 50 year celebration of BMW M. What a fantastic little car. Well, this is a little dose of nostalgia for me because, well, whilst I couldn't ever afford the M3, I did have, in my early 20s, the 328 E36 Coupe. This was always just a little bit out of reach. But this is very much the era of BMWs that I absolutely love. Now, the first and foremost reason is, of course, what's under the bonnet. This has the S50 B32 engine, if we're gonna get all geeky with engine codes, which, of course, is the 3.2 litre straight six engine, which some say is closely related slash half of a McLaren F1 engine, the iconic V12. Who knows if it is? I don't know for sure. There'll be people in the comments arguing below, I'm sure, telling us either way. Now the thing that made this car so significant is of course it had a really really hard act to follow or did it because of course it followed directly from the E30 and the E30 was such a successful racing car for touring car for DTM and it raced and competed all over the world. The E36 came along and it wasn't quite as motorsporty. It didn't have big wide haunched arches on the rear. In fact, the main criticism at the time of its launch was, well, it looks a little bit too similar to the non-M3. The E30 was wider, it was lower, it looked more aggressive. This put them side by side, a 328 IS and an M3, and most people will be hard pushed to tell the difference. What did improve though, is that engine. Of course, people complained with the E30 that the iconic straight six wasn't there. BMWs have been famous since the 1930s for having iconic straight six engines, and yet in the E30, they put in an inline four. The straight six made a comeback here though, and my goodness me, that was definitely celebrated. This is from the era where engines were built with pure passion. It is through and through a motorsport derived engine. Nobody can argue just like they do with the modern or newer, I should say, 1M, that this isn't an M car because it is. The engine is M, the suspension is M, everything about it is M. Of course, as a racing car, this did very well as well. And that always helps with the history and the pedigree. Now, although I said I could never afford the M3, even as a used car 10 years ago, I really wish, but don't we all, 
that I found or borrowed some money somewhere to buy one. Because I can remember these things selling for about £3,000. You'd be hard pushed now to find even a really, really ropey one for less than 15 grand. And if you find yourself a really nice example, well, sky's the limit. I've seen E36 M3s now listing for nearly £20,000. In a world of modern cars, the E36 has kind of shone through unexpectedly as a bit of a desirable classic to own. For a long time, me being one of these people, people assumed that the E36 just wasn't really gonna to get to that classic car status. It wasn't really ever gonna be heralded as this heroic M car of yesteryear. But thanks to the way that modern M cars are going and what modern sports coupes in general, this really has now kind of found its way from the back of the crowd and is now standing out at the forefront. Driving this is, for me, obviously, very reminiscent. It reminds me of very happy times. It reminds me of the visceral enjoyment of driving that you just don't often find as much in modern day cars. It's not a shouty car, the E36. It doesn't make a ripping, roaring sound from the exhaust. There's no snarling, aggressive, overly complicated induction noises from under the bonnet either. This thing just gets the job done. It gets it done quietly, comfortably, but when you want to feel like you're driving a performance car, well, it does that as well. The E36, I think it's fair to say, was a controversial choice for many at the time of its launch, but it has aged like so many other BMWs have with grace. People are really excited by it. It's great to see them still driving on the road. And this, a car that, believe it or not, has done only 5,700 miles, will live on for many, many more years to come. These examples of cars will provide enjoyment for drivers like you and me, and maybe even two or three generations of people younger than us. And they'll be able to experience what we all absolutely fell in love with at the time that they came out. This has been an absolute joy to be back in an E36. And yeah, what a wonderful car. I'm very happy with my two car selection that I've taken from the showroom. Thank you so much for watching today's video, our deep dive celebrating 50 years of BMW M. Of course, our thanks go to Partridge BMW for, first of all, lining up this amazing collection of cars, but also for being so hospitable with us here over the past few days. What have we missed? Chances are I have missed something. So let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to hit that bell and subscribe to the channel and also see everything that we do at drivenchat.com. For now, that leaves me to say thank you, goodbye, and we'll see you again soon.